Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. And hello to people that are out there in TV land and for folks that are on the phone. My name is Vince Warren. I'm the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And today we have a really interesting uh, forum for you today. We're going to be in conversation with my colleagues, Nadia Ben Youssef and Angelo Gusado, who I'm going to introduce uh, in a second. And um, one of the interesting things about being at CCR in this political moment is that things move so quickly. Um, it is virtually impossible to plan. We have this big challenge where um, funders and foundations will ask you, what are you going to be doing five years from now? We don't know what the heck we're going to be doing five years from now because the world is going to hell in a handbasket and we have to figure out how we're going to be uh, positioning ourselves between the bad stuff that is happening now and the communities that need us. But we also need to be thinking about the long-term arc of this country and our democracy and how we're going to be positioned there. So we have a real challenge there. And one of the interesting pieces is that one of the uh, folks that I was going to introduce you today, Brittany Thomas, who is a Bertha Justice Fellow. Uh, she, was, uh, she was someone that was going to be talking with you, a, a new, relatively new lawyer, uh, relatively new at CCR. She was going to be chatting with you um, about um, her path to get here. But it turns out that her path took an interesting term, turn, which is that we filed a case against Donald Trump's public charge uh, regulations. And for those of you who don't know, public charge is yet another of um, a deeply disturbing, troubling uh, manifestation of trying to uh, criminalize and uh, oppress people in this country by requiring, uh, by saying that they will not be able to move to the next step in the path of citizenship if they have taken public benefits. And so this is, if we think about this as a corollary to the work that we're doing around bans and around borders and around walls and around deportations and around criminalization of black and brown communities, we also have to understand that there's an economic component to this. And one of the interesting pieces is um, if you are, are you come into the country and you are not able to find work right away, um, one of the things that you do is you ask for assistance temporarily until you get on your feet. But of course, then if you're trying to move to the next step, if Trump has its way, the fact that you chose to have assistance um, is going to be used against you, almost presuming that everybody asks for assistance and a helping hand, which we all need in this country at one point in our lives or another, is a uh, determinative of how you're going to spend the rest of your time here. So I'm happy to say that CCR has been uh, j jumped on that case uh, with the um, with the Legal Aid Society here in New York and as part of a national constellation of uh, lawyers and advocates that are working on that issue. And Brittany is at the hearing, which is this morning. So um, I'm sure she'll be able to fill you in on that and other things. And if I hear anything um, that I can share during this conversation, I will share it with you. But Having said that, we have two extraordinary uh, human beings, um, some of you, whom uh, you might not have met before, so I'm really happy to introduce them to you. And we're going to be talking about um, not just the substantive part of the work, but we're talking about why did we get into this work to begin with? What is it that prompted these two folks and folks at CCR to sign up to enroll in this project that we're um, undertaking to do our best to save democracy. Um, and so on my far right is Angelo Guisado, who's a staff attorney. Um, and he was, prior to coming here, he was at uh, the law firm of Paul Weiss. Um, prior to that, he was at Fordham Law School, where he graduated in 2012. I happen to know that he is a mentor to several Fordham Law students that are coming through right now. They all talk about how wonderful he is. He's also the author of a forthcoming report on white supremacy that we will be having, so stay tuned for that. And interestingly and importantly, he um, was also a law, a law clerk for the federal judge, uh, Damon Keith of the Sixth Circuit, who was a giant, just passed, I think this year, a giant in civil rights uh, history. Um, so we're really happy to have him here. He works on uh, a constellation of uh, immigration related cases, including our case Migrant Justice, East Bay Sanctuary, Al Ocho Lado, and also does some policing work as well for Furlough versus Belmar, which is challenging the wanted system in St. Louis. 
And to my immediate right is Nadia Ben Youssef, who is our brand spanking new advocacy director. And uh, Nadia comes uh, to us from Adala Justice Project, uh, which, which is based here in the United States, where she's been doing extraordinary work uh, on behalf of uh, Palestinian solidarity and also bringing into uh, the role of, of solidarity, bringing in U.S. actors um, to begin to join that struggle, to be able to be part of that fight and to really think through um, the domestic perspective through the lens of what's happening internationally. Um, she was also a, won an award from the National Lawyers Guild, the Rob Doyle Lawyer Award uh, for commitment to political and social justice. Nadia is an advocacy director and an artist at heart, but she also was trained as a lawyer as well, um, graduating in, was it 18? Yes, um, that was in 1800s, <laughs> 2009, 2010 um, from law school. So please um, join me in welcoming Angelo and Nadia. So I'm going to throw out a question. And the question I want to throw out to both of you uh, was first was when was your aha moment? And this is the moment when you knew that you were going to work in social justice. All of us have one. It could be our families, it could be uh, political connection, it could be college, but we're curious, what was your aha moment? All right, thank you for that, Vince. And so excited to be with you all this, this afternoon. And hopefully as we discuss our aha moments and what brings us to the work, I also would love to hear from you all um, and hopefully get a chance to chat a little bit about why you're here too. Um, and I think you're right, Vince, I mean, so much of, you know, I, I try, I think, and it's a conversation that we'll continue to have about how we bring our ancestors into this room and who we are as people and how that, how that determines our lives in really extraordinary ways. And so I am the daughter of refugees and of immigrants um, and the sister of a child with special needs. I, I think part of that coincided in, in an understanding of what is fair, um, an obsession about injustice, and I think, and, and a commitment to uprooting a lot of the forces that would challenge a family like mine um, with regard to where we came from, with regard to how we ended up in Eastern Montana, which is where I grew up, um, with regard to the challenges that my brother faced. And I think my political journey started from a space where I assumed that injustice was a matter of chance, um, that our immigration and refugee story was less designed by the powerful and more circumstantial it, and my my little brother's um special needs and disabilities were all around chance um and luck and as i moved into the social justice world um i approached my obligation more as a responsibility in that spirit that because this concept and it's Judeo-Christian, and also you see it in Islam as well, but that to, to who much is given, much is expected. And so all of the privileges of my life, I thought that I had an obligation, but because of chance. And I think as I journeyed through my life and kept trying to do more like charitable work, seeing it as a charitable work that I needed to give back, um, I kept running against the system. So if I was working in issues of you know an at-risk school program for example i was running against a system of a failed education for certain communities if i was working on access to health care in chicago i was running into disparate house um, health outcomes for certain communities and i started understanding that the system is not by chance it's not broken it is a system that is designed in a particular way and then I went into law school after doing a lot of community um, development work, whether in Chicago or in New Jersey or in Montana where I grew up, um, and started really understanding that the law was a tool of an institutional design. 
And I think it was those, that was the moment, even though I had a social justice bone in my body, um, that I had my wake up or aha moment where it was like, oh, this is not by chance. I grew up in Montana, I said. So my, my favorite country song at the time was Martina McBride. I don't know if you all in New York. Anyway, the lyrics are, we're all just seeds in God's hand. We're all the same, but where we land is sometimes fertile soil and sometimes sand. We're all just seeds in God's hand. And that was my political orientation until I went to law school and realized that this scattering of seeds is by design. And some people end up in fertile soil by design. And some people end up in sand by design. And our obligation is to transform those systems and to uproot the injustice um, and recognizing that, yeah, that, that was my task and that's why I'm here. Thank you so much for that. And Angelo, building on that, I wanna ask another question for you to fold in in addition to your aha moment. Um, and Nadia talked a little bit about this. And the question is, do you bring your personal experiences or your community's experience with injustice into the work? And if so, how? Um, two great questions. And I wish I had such a captivating narrative <laughs> like my colleague Nadia. Um, so my aha moment, uh, it's actually like particularized. I remember it very vividly. Um, I was studying philosophy in college. I had dreamed that I would be some sort of like erudite professor. Like I was going to be my parents' American dream. And then there was an incident in 2006 or 2007 um, called the Gina Six. And it referenced uh, a white supremacist um, targeting of six African-American high schoolers in Gina, Louisiana. And I'm not going to say that going to college in the early aughts was like post-racial, but it certainly didn't have the same emphasis on racial justice and the terrible effects of white supremacy that we have now. I attribute social media and the proliferation of um, you know, Twitter and Instagram, et cetera, to sort of spread the movement's visibility. However, when we heard about the Gina Six incidents, I and other members of the school's Black Student Union decided to dress in all Black and stage a, a walkout. And I think that was really my first foray into political activism. And I definitely jettisoned the sort of like erudition of professorship. And it was like, no, social justice is what I want to do. Civil rights is where I'm meant to be. And that followed me ever since. Um, to the question of bringing my personal experiences, why did that affect me so greatly? Well, um, my mother, uh, who's a former public defender, was a volunteer with the Black Panther Party in East Oakland in the 1970s. My grandmother was a tenants' rights organizer right here in New York City. She was actually red listed. Um, Paul Robeson was a regular visitor to the household. And so this was always sort of like innate in our household. Moreover, my father, like none of these parents, uh, also a refugee, technically an undocumented immigrant currently. And so much of the work that I'm able to do fighting on behalf of these immigrant communities, I'm also fighting for my family. For one, my father, who came over in 1980 in the Mariel boat lift, um, well, I know for a fact that oftentimes people reference um, the first Cuban wave of immigration, but of course, the uh, Cubans who came in 1980 and the Haitians who came around that same time weren't exactly treated with the same welcome man. And we all know why. That's, um, they were vilified. That's the sort of um, pernicious white supremacy that inheres our whole political sphere. And so these... Um, these facts really sort of shaped my viewpoint and my practice. And so when I go to the border at Tijuana, for instance, and I see um, migrants from Cameroon and Senegal and Haiti, and they're just languishing on the other side of the border and they can't get through, well, like Nadia said, that's by design, right? That's intentional. That's our immigration system recognizing its preference um, for white, wealthy immigrants and about which Vince just spoke. That's really what the public charge rule is all about. And so those are the sorts of things that I bring with me when I do this sort of work. And it's probably why I'll never leave. Thank you. So when I was talking about Paul Weiss, the law firm, you weren't expecting that, were you? Um, here's, you know, the, 
I'm so grateful um, that you all opened that way because I think part of what you all um, who support CCR help us to do is to really attract the people who uh, can transform, who's, who are all about transformation. And transforming during using the law and advocacy is not an easy thing at all. Um, so it does take people um, that I think not just have the grit and have the political knowledge, but also I think have um, the spirit the core of, of change in their being. And it does very much help uh, when those of us who come from backgrounds uh, where we're really seeing that it's our people that are on the firing line and not those people that are on the firing line uh, really helps. So I wanted to ask you all this. You, um, you all have been working in a variety of different contexts. Um, how is working at CCR different from any other job that you've had, or is it? I'll start with the obvious. I mean, you take a look at Vince, Nadia, and I, and well, it looks a lot different than Paul Weiss. <laughs> There's a famous quote by the revered Zora Neale Hurston, and it goes, I feel most colored when pressed up against a lily white background. And I think when you look at the staff here and you find people not just from different racial, ethnic backgrounds, but all walks of socioeconomic life, people um, on the LGBTQI spectrum, individuals who um, have disabilities. I think CCR is just like the only place at which I've ever worked where I don't feel like I stand out in a negative way, right? So as my brief tenure at Paul Weiss, like, you know, they're expecting you to dress, talk, part your hair in a certain way. CCR is just the place where I feel at ease or at home. I don't have to be performative. And that's unique and special. And I think it's what separates CCR from maybe some other organizations that may have a bit of a um, more notable pallor to them. Uh, plus one and plus a thousand to that answer. I think that's, it is a, it's a remarkable place in, in that way and who are, our colleagues are and our comrades in struggle. And I think you, you made a, a great point, Vince, the, the difference that it makes when our attorneys and our advocates are, reflect the communities that we're, that we're fighting with. Um, and that has changed our demands, I think, too. I think CCR articulates both what it is resisting and what it is seeking in perhaps the clearest way in the social justice space because of that because it's real, because it's tangible, because it matters not in the abstract, but in a material way that we win. And we will win, I think, because we have that determination. So I agree. I think um, I come from the world of, of Palestinian rights organizing mostly, and um, CCR is the most politically coherent organization that I have ever worked with, whether as a partner, which we were longtime partners of the Center for Constitutional Rights coming from Palestinian human rights organizations, where it was the only organization that was willing to say anything or to stand with um, Palestinians who are struggling for freedom and justice. And the Center for Constitutional Rights is coherent to its core about standing on the side of those who are historically marginalized and oppressed committing to their liberation because it's a recognition that our liberation is tied and has done that since the beginning so just a quick anecdote about how this played out is we went in february to meet the squad and the new members of congress and just kind of and we were there in partnership too with a palestinian delegation so we went with partners from um, from the ground in Palestine, from here, and we went to say, you know, this is what the this is what the the left looks like. This is what the progressive community looks like. It's transnational. It is connected in really profound ways. And Vince would start his remarks by saying, you know, do you know the history of CCR? And a lot of people did. I have to say, in this new Congress, it's a totally different situation. Um, and people were really moved that we were there. But he said, you know, the origin story is the, the lawyers who, who started CCR first represented Fannie Lou Hamer um, and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party because it was integrated and not allowed to go to the Democratic National Committee. That was our origin. And then he said, and that's why we're here. 
And they were shocked. They're like, and that's why we're here protecting Palestinian rights, because that's our origin story. And it was such a beautiful moment for me to, to see how CCR really stands completely apart from, from so many other organizations, just to say, we're here, we've been here, and we're committed to being here until we win. Thank you. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about the doing of the work. Um, you know, all of you know that CCR is deeply um, connected to social movements and we do the work in that context. Um, talk to us a little bit about what it is like in the church basements. So you are trying to move forward a pretty bold strategy and you're trying to move it forward with people and not for people and not on top of people. Um, you're trying to lead from behind. You're trying to co-create strategies together and all of which during a time of some of the greatest political democratic upheaval of our time, you go into a meeting, you come out and you read Twitter and something completely different has happened. What, it's, what is it? What have you been hearing? Um, in community with the people that we are partnering with about what they need in this moment, what they're trying to do, what they need from us in this moment. You know, just give us a little sense of what that looks like. Wow, great question. Um, so you, you started by, you know, how I would initially answer this is particularly with regard to advocacy. So if I can just step back just to give a sense of what advocacy is or what we imagine it to be. Um, and we, we've done a lot of work in the last seven months with the advocacy team to kind of understand our own role. And we coalesced around this idea that we are co-designing the cultural, political, and even legal interventions with our movement partners and with our allies and with impacted communities. So advocacy is what are the cultural and political interventions that you're going to make to advance the policy that you want to see? It's a bit more four-footed, front-footed. The idea that CCR is excellent in the resistance phase. The, you know, we are lawyers who have historically and continue to hold the line for social movements. So we stand in between the terrible things and the people with the law and with all of our tools to resist the world that we have. Advocacy is about articulating and moving towards the world that we want. So we're trying to shift our posture a little bit from this defensive strategy towards this offensive, where are we going? What are we building and how do we get there? So part of that is the vision for how we get there. Who needs to make that vision? Who articulates the vision of where we're going? Is it lawyers and advocates? Or is it the people that are impacted? And you're nodding your heads because it's the people who are impacted, who set the vision for where we're going. And those of us who are walking and have particular tools and skills to support that vision are walking alongside of them. So part of the work that we're doing when we're articulating uh, you know, where we're trying to go. So I'll give you an example, for example, um, from Louisiana. So in Louisiana, we are representing the river parishes between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, who, these are historically black communities who have been inundated by petrochemical plants. Um, there are some 200 petrochemical plants. The rate, the risk of the rate of cancer, respiratory cancer, is 800 times the national average. It's called Cancer Alley, but the community has renamed it Death Alley because people are dying. And we are intervening legally in all sorts of ways, one to stop pipeline expansion, to um, you know, protect folks from this fierce uh, corporate takeover um, of their lives, their land, and their health. And now these river parishes mostly community churches and um, community groups who have been fighting in various ways have come together. There's a coalition against Death Alley that we've been working with, and they've articulated for the first time the demand that there be a moratorium on oil and gas in Louisiana. Unbelievable demand. It's never been done before. It's a petro state. So the fact that, and they've, many of whom in this area have worked in those industries, 
benefit economically from those industries, but have said, but you're killing us and we refuse. And so they say, we're calling for a moratorium. What can you do to get us there? So we have our lawyers coming in. We have our advocates coming in. What are the political interventions that we're going to make in order for you to get there? And that's a completely different and unique to CCR, I think, strategy where you listen to the community, articulate the goals of where you're going, and then we create those interventions to get us there. So that's one reflection. I really like Vince's question because one of the things that I've started to realize over my almost three years here is that our clients have all been making the same consistent demands, which some people would categorize as revolutionary or perhaps pie in the sky or perhaps unrealistic, right? But it's only now that many of these bold ideas and visions for an anti-capitalist um, transracial future, what we see is that, I'll give an anecdote from our client al otro lado. They work on the border in Tijuana, and then they also have some sort of satellite operations elsewhere. But they've been calling for an end to the punitive immigration detention system for over a decade. They knew it was a problem. They knew it was inhumane. They knew that just if the person in charge were switched, the capacity and capability for monstrosity would occur. And they were arguing and forcefully um, ad advocating for an end to immigration detention system under Obama, during which family separations did occur, during which people did die in ICE custody, during which he deported two million people. It's only now that people are starting to say, well, maybe we should rethink immigration detention. We have the utmost privilege and pleasure of uplifting those voices and representing the people who consistently for decades have been advocating for radical positions. And now that sort of the spotlight is on them, people are starting to reconsider um, commonplace notions of what society can and should look like. And I think now we're particularly well primed to uplift and shine a light on the people in the community who have been oppressed and who have known what these problems are and have been for so long. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, just I'm noting the question of um, that when we were with our, our litigation partners, when we were with our movement partners, we we're with our clients, um, the demands that they're making on society are also demands that they make on CCR in the sense that in order to achieve what they want to achieve, they've chosen us as a set of people, a an organization and some technical skills to be able to help advance that. And that is an awesome responsibility. And I think it's one that has to be handled with care and respect. And, you know, and the way that you all, I've seen you all um, work with clients and work in those spaces is extraordinary. The depthness um, by which you can code switch from policy to community. And that's really, really important. And we really wouldn't be able to do that work if we didn't have uh, the wonderful support of folks like you in the room, folks like you on the phone. Because what you're doing is you're, when, you're, when your client is social change, um, then your investment is CCR. And that's what we're seeing here. And I wanna, I'm going to open it up for, for questions because I hope um, that there are a range of ideas and thoughts that have been surfaced today that you might actually want to know more about from uh, our colleagues. But before I do that, I want to just put something else on the table because I know that some of you will have very specific questions about very specific issues of the day that are happening right now. And I certainly understand that and I applaud that and I'm happy to answer those to the extent that I can. Um, but I wanted to talk about methodology. There are a lot of organizations that you can support and there are organ a lot of organizations that you do support. There are, in my my view, very few organizations that offer what we've just heard today. And I will also put my reputation on the line is that if you talked to any movement group today that we work with and ask them, what is CCR like to work like? They will say 
that we are one of the best partners that they've had because that has been part of the culture shift that we've done here at CCR. It's not just fighting the big cases, which we do, and it's not just being on the front lines, which we are, but it is also about being the best value added partner to social change that we can be. And I hope you're seeing some of that today. Um, I, was I was chatting with my friend Susan, um, who is here today, and she said, I hope you're going to talk about impeachment. So as I'm going to, I'm going to say a few words on that, but I would, you know, I'm going to be throwing it out for questions in exactly two minutes and 45 seconds. Um, so here's my two minutes and 45 seconds on impeachment. Going back to the way that Nadia and um, Angelo framed it is that we can either invest in the uh, activity of the moment or we can invest in the long game. And so the question that we should be asking ourselves is what does impeachment mean for the people right now? We know what it means for democracy. We know what it means for our own sense of this has been going on for way too long and somebody needs to do something about that guy. But the question really is what does impeachment do for for all of us, is it going to make um, the people in Death Alley who have a um, state-focused campaign, is it gonna make them better off? Is it going to make um, the folks who have been pushing for the end for a punitive detention system in immigration, is it gonna make them better off? And there are elements of if we got rid of that guy, there would be room to breathe, no question about it. But the question for you is, is that where our work ends? If they impeach this cat tomorrow, does that mean that we get to go on vacation on Wednesday? Definitely not. We never get to go on vacation. Here's so, um, the, but here's my, my analysis. Um, the, if we compare the Mueller report Believe me, I can go on for days talking about 1973 um, and, and the Nixon analogies, which I won't. Um, but I will say if we compare the Mueller report process to what's happening now, we can see some really clear differences. Difference number one is that essentially the Mueller report was a, a series of um, conspiratorial activities. And I mean conspiratorial in the legal sense, not in the conspiracy theory sense, um, that Congress vested in a special prosecutor to collect the information and then to present the information to Congress for action. Now, the challenge there is that number one, the information was largely contained within the prosecutorial group. Number two, that they were largely prosec prosecutorial um, and prosecutorial people think in very narrow ways, unless of course they're prosecuting black and brown people and then anything goes. And then the third thing is that the dude that they wanted to present this option was Robert Mueller who, um, as I've said before, many people thought this is man is gonna be the savior of the universe. But if you look back at his history and particularly you look back to uh, when we sued him for rounding up Muslims and Arabs right after 9-11, those of us in this room had a, a sense that what was gonna come out of that process was not likely going to be the change that we wanted. And we ended up with what we got. But we have a different situation here. CCR has a long history of representing whistleblowers and there's a reason for that. And the reason why is that the whistleblower, the, the set of human beings, and now they're proliferating, I think we're seeing more and more, um, can shed light on a particular set of misdeeds without theoretically sort of a political veneer to it. The dude did this on this phone call on this day. And what makes it different is that you know, the whistleblower said it happened on this phone call on this day. 45 said, I did it on that phone call on this day. The messed up little fake transcript that is not even the real transcript of the phone call said that he did it. And that if you look at the um, whistleblower complaint, it does say that there are a number of people that were also in that room. So what it does is it narrows the issue from did it happen to did it not happen? We know that it happened and the question is now politically, what is Congress going to do about it? And we know that we that the Democrats are likely seeing the ability to move this forward relatively quickly. We also should be prepared for the fact that the Senate will not vote to remove him. We have to be prepared for that. Right. Um, but that's not a cause for dismay. I think that's the question is, is this a cause for momentum or not? And I think it is a cause for momentum and not just in the electoral context, but I think also in the movement context as well. So I'll leave that there. And um, I would love to open up for questions. If people that are on the phone have questions, uh, please feel free to email them in and they will get to me. Um, and does anybody in the room 
uh, want to start off with questions for our guests here. Hi, Julie Kay, former CCR board member, has a question. <laughs> I sure will. I, I'll repeat it for for them. I, I sure will. <laughs> so Ju Julie was asking a, a couple of questions. Number one is how do we um, how do we calibrate the wor the work that we're doing on the the long term work that we're doing on the ground and the constant stream of uh, Trumpiness that comes in. How do we balance the current flashy moment from the long term goal? Also. Um, Looking forward for a couple of years, CCR is in a competitive field with other, other organizations. And so how do we think three or four years down the road? Um, I was joking about that we're not, we don't know what's going to happen in five years. And I was actually joking about that. Um, but how do we do that, I think is the question. Um, let me start. I'll start off with the, with the balancing, uh, looking down the road. Um, it's a – what we did um, – we are an organization that I think works better with what – is called a rolling strategy as opposed to a static strategy. So some organizations will say, let's look five years down the road and let's say what we're gonna do with clarity over the next five years. And there is real value to that. Um, there is um, organizational coherence. Everybody knows what they're gonna do. Everybody's rowing on the same page and then you can assess from year to year whether you've achieved your goals. It doesn't necessarily work for an agile organization that must respond to the political pressures of the day. So if you look at it just in terms of decades, you can tell who our clients are. You can tell what's going on in the country by looking at who our clients are. Uh, Al Rubin um, wrote an extraordinary book who's here on CCR can attest to this. In the 1960s, our, cl our clients were largely uh, black sharecroppers. In the 1970s, they were uh, anti-war protesters and people getting arrested for um, for registering people to vote in the 1960s. We also represented women um, who were seeking abortion. In the 1980s, we represented people who were um, resisting uh, US intervention in uh, Central America. In the 1990s, we were representing uh, folks who were being criminalized by a resurgence of white supremacy in the Klan. You remember 9-11 and here we are today. So what, you, what is clear is that we cannot predict with precision the acts that are going to happen, but we can predict with precision the political structures and how those structures operate. We know that um, white supremacists, uh, this is, this is a, a, re, it's a resurgence of white supremacy, but it's really more of a resurfacing. Um, it didn't end when Barack Obama was there. So at some level, we had a sense that this was gonna happen. We know what's gonna happen with respect to how immigrants, um, people coming into this country are going to be detained regardless of what happens in the next presidential election. I'll remind you that when most other organizations, when Barack Obama was president, they were moving towards a pathway to citizenship. Everybody was having meetings in the White House about how do we get that pathway written. CCR was not on the pathway to the White House. What we were doing is we had determined that the question was going to be, even if there was a grand deal that is... Um, uh, struck in Congress around around immigration that we're going to be standing with the people that will be deported and the people that will be detained because as a back counterbalance to that for every person that is given a quote unquote pathway to citizenship um, hundreds maybe even thousands of people are detained or deported so we're always looking at that next cutting edge so what we so the the shorter version is. Um, in the rolling plan, what we've done is we were going to be looking actually in about uh, later on this month, we're going to be looking uh, two, two years down the road. And we're going to put everything up on this uh, board here in the conference room. What's the bad stuff that is going to happen that we predict is going to happen? And it's not just what's he going to tweet, but it really is the structural question is where, uh, how do police unions use this moment to be able to, uh, to resurface because nobody's talking about policing right now. How are um, black organizers 
connecting with their organizations and with their communities and what are they pushing for? Uh, what's going to be happening in foreign policy? We put that stuff up against the wall. Then we ask the second question, which is we know the bad stuff that's going to happen. And the question is, who is it going to happen to? And that's our cue to begin to connect with the communities that we are anticipating will be in the middle of the firing line over the next couple of years. And then the third piece is this is what we're doing now. How do we need to shift our work to be able to get between the bad stuff that's going to happen and the things that it's going to happen to um, it, it, people that it's going to happen to in a couple of years? Um, so that's a, okay, that wasn't a minute and 45 seconds, but it was a good answer. Um, Nadia, um, Angelo, anything else particularly with respect to how do we deal with the long-term work versus the tweets in the current moment? Yeah, it's a great question, Julie. And um, it's something that we, we think a lot about, particularly with regard to advocacy, kind of hearkening back to the earlier answer about what advocacy is and the, the promise of advocacy, which is really to put forward the alternative vision of what we know is going to happen. So my, my hope, um, kind of long term, is that we can really do this fundamental shift even in our imaginary, right? I think what is possible happens first in the imaginary. If you can imagine it, then you can start building towards it. And I think on the left, our imaginations are atrophied, in part because of the fires that we're fighting, in part because we are in emergency mode and that we are constantly fighting. And so we don't have the ability to imagine what we want. And so my goal is that as we do this, which we're going to do on October 23rd, <laughs> this kind of walk around what is all the terrible things that are going to happen, we put some of our intellectual labor into imagining what we want. And we've been talking about how do we frame this as the irresistible future? Like how can we articulate it with specificity what it is that we are fighting for? As the alternative, I think we have very clearly... Um, and this is a, a donor of ours, Carolyn, it's Carolyn's last name, that we just met in San Francisco. Carolyn, we just met Purcell. So Carolyn Purcell, a longtime donor of CCR that we met in San Francisco a number of weeks ago, said, you know, we know the authoritarian playbook. CCR knows it, specifically because of all the things that have been said and how long we've been at this fight with people who are, who are resisting. Um, fascism and white supremacy and xenophobia and bigotry in all of its forms. We know the authoritarian playbook. What's amazing, because we are rooted in social movements, we also know the people's playbook. We know what resistance looks like. We know what a vision for social change looks like. And I really want us to put more of, I mean, in my, in my dream, is that we put more of our efforts there. And I think that will require also airlifting our people out of these moments of crisis and giving them space to imagine and to vision and to dream and to put that on paper as what it is we're trying to achieve um, and what it is that they need our assistance to get towards. And um, so that's how I would answer that question. Thanks. Um, I have sort of an unusual answer, but I think it's apt. CCR isn't just a litigation powerhouse. It's not just an advocacy powerhouse. We have tremendous educational value here. And I view a lot of what we do is sort of, I view it pedagogically, right? And that I mean that thanks to the folks in this room and who are watching, we have the opportunity to train and mentor the next generation of lawyers. I refer to our summer program, the Ella Baker internship, and of course, a uh, through the birth the justice program, um, the four to five lawyers we hire uh, every two years. And I think that CCR is particularly well equipped to sort of inform and train the next batch of social justice lawyers who may in law school, maybe in currently in law school, sort of freaking out per se about what the president's tweeting or like where they're going to work, what job, whereas we sort of always maintain a central focus. Who are the communities that we re represent? How do patterns of oppression replicate and duplicate and proliferate? A and what does the next batch of social justice lawyering look like? And I think through tons of programs and tremendous work to Rachel Mirapol, um, who runs the summer program, we've been able to sort of talk, mentor, um, and lead by example um, what C who CCR is as an institution, what we view the fight to look like, and how we think we're getting there. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Pat. Uh, the question was, what was the extent of the family separation crisis uh, under Obama? Um, so this is, I guess, anecdotal, and I don't have statistical evidence to back this, but our client, Al Otro Lado, um, repeatedly uh, bears on the fact that um, what was instituted as formal policy by Jeff Sessions in April of 2018 had, in fact, occurred for many years prior to um, under Obama, I think it may have been more the case of, you know, rogue separation or perhaps like um, individual instances. But I think when you start to see the, the discussion now around the Flores settlement and the fight that was occurring, the Flores settlement um, governs uh, under what conditions the United States can detain um, immigrant children. And families, I think the fact that we, they had to have family based detention centers to begin with, right? I think we have a movement partner named Aldea who, who works down in Pennsylvania. And, and, and you know, they, re, they report that they have policies of waking up immigrant women and their children every 30 minutes by flashing the lights on and off, causing intentionally sleep deprivation. And it's like this didn't start occurring when Trump took office, the sort of punitive detention um, against people who commit like a, uh, an instance of being born on the wrong side of a line. And now that's criminalized. These are all things that, you know, were seedlings under under Bush and Obama and have now fully sprouted and grown. Um, so I don't have a precise statistic, but they certainly were doing it and still are. Yeah, thank you for that, Angelo. And it, and it goes back to, to Nadia's question about um, the what are we what are we for as opposed to what we're against. Everybody in this room would be against the current child separation regime. Kids go here, parents go there, right? When and Angelo was mentioning the Flores settlement, which we are all now fighting to um, have still stay in place. But what the Flores settlement did, amongst many other things. Um, it also required, or the Obama policy required, that families be together. You would think that's a good idea until you hear the stories of how it's actually happening. So the flashlight in waking up the families is for the following reason. Um, the mothers and the kids are allowed to be in the same cell together, but the kids are not allowed to sleep in the same bed as the mom. So what they would do is they would go and wake everybody up to make sure and then rest the kid from the mom's bed and put the kid in a different bed in the same cell. That's, that's what success looked like under the Obama administration. And it's far worse under Trump. But as Nadia would point out, is this what we want? Is this how we want um, our system to be working so that we're it's better to wake kids up and yank them out of mom's bed than to put them in different cells? No. And this is what advocates, and I think you, I love the idea of the revolutionary demands, um, the irresistible future. This is what activists have been calling for for decades. And the challenge is that there are no legal and policy groups, or very few of us, that are willing to put out there this question of reimagining the way that we detain people. And, you know, that's also what makes our work for some quarters feel like it's unrealistic. Like, well, I mean, are you really going to get that? But as, you know, we pointed out, if you don't ask for it, you will never get it. And so what is the, what is the harm of enrolling ourselves in a vision of the future where we're not detaining people? Um, we have time for one more question. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully, and again, because especially many, many, many uh, issues, 
and hopefully will be continuing to support what we as a country can and will achieve. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. malady and the law. And now the information that I'm hearing to go to advocacy seems to me a bend towards social work. That is, you're more, you're interested in this idea of visioning, which has a roots in psychology and social work has is both there. Um, I'm concerned that the role that has been the previous role of CCR to stay with the litigation and help us to see how the law is that design. Because to me, this whole thing about it's by design is a little troubling. Who's designing? Is it some manifest? I see it as a manifestation of something in human beings, not a superpower that it has a design like some, you know, aforementioned deity. But um, but some some manifestation of something that's in humanity that is designing the law, and I I have always relied on CCR to be the interpreter of how the law can represent that change, and I I see all this. <laughs> Great question. This is a fantastic question to close on. I'm going to just tease it. Nadia is going to fill your soul with um, how we're going to win, and then I'm going to close. And I will open it up in this way. And the question was, um, Susan was con is heard what she heard about building the advocacy program as moving away from or de-emphasizing litigation. So let me just say to everybody, um, one of the key things about leadership in CCR and in our social justice movements is that we are a, um, we, we tend to think in buts, meaning that I like what you said about advocacy, but I want you to continue to, to do litigation. And the whole key to imagining what we are as our best self is to not use the word but, which I banned in the organization. I use the word and. And the question is, we're going to be doing the same and more cutting edge litigation. And we are going to support that with what our movement partners need, which is also being able to be out there around the politics of the case. So the way that I think of the politics of the issue. So the way that I think about it, if you think about the social justice sphere as an ocean, think about litigation as islands. And there are particular islands of litigation that we do. When you lose the case, or if the, you win the case and the case is over, it raises this question, do we still care about this issue? There are a lot of organizations that don't care about the issue after they win or lose the case. We care about it and we're invested in it. And part of the work that advocacy does is it helps to get us there with our partners. We can do the extraordinary litigation work and then we can continue to do more because this is a political problem that we have and not just a legal problem. So I wanted just to say that please think about the and and not the but when we're talking about um, the litigation and advocacy. Any comments? It's such a great question, Susan, and it's something that also I was referring to Carolyn Purcell, another longtime donor, also said the same thing, and it was her first question. She was like, first, I don't like the word advocacy. I don't know what that means. And what I love about CCR is the, is the work of litigation. Um, but as we were diving into what she also loves about CCR um, is that it is a vanguard in terms of pushing forward an agenda of social transformation. It is not a stagnant organization. It's not we're resisting and we're going to take on a litigation. It's, it's impact litigation, right? So we take cases that if we win, we win, but if we lose, we also win. Success without victory, right? And the success without victory is, does the litigation propel the social transformation that we're looking for? Because ultimately we're, we are, we are looking to transform 
the systems and structures of oppression that force us into litigation on behalf of social movements and on behalf of communities. Ideally, the social justice movement, the left, community organizations who are committed to social change want to put themselves out of business. Ideally, right? Like we want to move and build a world where these systems and structures of oppression are no longer stifling the lives and the dreams and the abilities of marginalized and oppressed communities. We don't want that anymore. And I think advocacy in partnership with litigation moves us towards that vision. So I think it is about can we create the conditions where we are making strategic, legal, political, and cultural interventions to get us closer to that reality? Um, and it is a recognition, as Vince was saying, that litigation is a tool. The law is a tool for that. CCR is an expert at that. Um, and advocacy has, for the most of CCR's um, history, accompanied the litigation. How do we amplify the resistance strategies? And now it's a shift to saying, not only are we amplifying the resistance strategies, but we're putting forward the affirmative vision so that we know the direction in which we're moving. Um, and so we are, what it allows us to do is while we're putting out the fires to identify the arson, right? Rather than going around putting out the fires without really saying, why is this happening? Why is this happening? What are the structures and the systems in place that are continuing, that are continuing this reality? Um, and I think once we identify that and we commit to a philosophy of struggle that puts these sort of values forward, we're going to see and contribute to pretty dramatic social change. And I think that's, that's the key for this moment. I think we are hungry. The left is hungry. Young people are hungry. You're seeing tremendous vision from young people with regard to the climate justice work, um, environmental justice work. They're hungry for leadership that tells us what is the world that we want and how do we get there? We know that climate change is real. We know that we need to stop petrochemical plants and we can do that with litigation and we can also do that in policy spheres and we can make changes to get us closer to the world that we want. So that's my commitment to advocacy. And Susan, I, I see you're still struggling with that and want to think with you about it. But it is, um, it's an exciting moment, I think, for CCR and it's an exciting moment for our community because we have everything that we need, not only to resist, but to imagine. Thank you for that, for that, Nadia. And I want to just close this out, if I could, um, with some thoughts here. One is that what I have been connected to CCR now for 18 years. And, you know, years on the board, uh, actually it's closer to 20, to be honest, um, six or seven years on the board, 13 years as executive director. And I can tell you this thing, that CCR's litigation has and continues to be extraordinary. I think we are better at litigating now than we were in the past. But the, the question is, what does the future look like? And part of the reason why um, it was so wonderful for Nadia and for Angelo to join us, because I wanted you all to see what the future of CCR looks like. We are actually not hiring people because they want to rep replicate strategies from 1978. That we're actually building strategies for 2030 essentially what we're doing. I would say, and I really do mean this humbly, that there's no other legal organization that is thinking about the work the way that we are doing. There's no other advocacy work organization that is thinking about the work that we're doing and has the ability to bring cutting edge litigation. This may be the next wave for how we deal with the work moving forward. This is the, this is the CCR innovates every 10 years or so. Um, and that our next step is really about building in the positive vision for what we're moving towards, as well as the negative image of what we're fighting against. So I just want you to remember the both and. And I also want to thank you because what you're hearing now, um, what you will be seeing in 2020 um, in terms of our work, should represent a real sea change in the way that we're trying to fight back. And we can't do it without the tremendous and dedicated support 
of folks like you. There are a lot of organizations, they will always um, send you information to say thank you very much for your support, but I actually really mean it. Because if it weren't for the support that we have from you all, we would not be able to think this big. I would not be able to be able to recruit somebody like Angelo here um, to take it to the streets the way that he does. Nadia's enormous and beautiful brain that says, why don't we think about doing this differently? This is the moment. And your support has, been, has meant the world to us and it will continue to, to mean the world. Um, and so I wanted to thank you for that. And then finally, um, here's where we are. Um, we will be meeting the next moment, the 2020s, the 2021s, the 2022, with greater capacity, with greater uh, determination, with a smarter strategy, with innovative thinking, and taking the same measure of risk moving forward that we did in the past. Because the thing that happens is when organizations get too big, they get less risky. We know those organizations. That is not us. And the whole idea with CCR is to be able to grow our impact without growing so much that we become the stodgy top-down organization that is, is resting on the victories of 10 years ago. I'm dreaming of the victories 10 years from now. Nadia is dreaming, dreaming of the victories from 10 years from now, and Angelo is. And I know you are. So I want to thank you all very much for being here, for supporting us the way that you do. And the next 10 years are going to be extraordinary. Thank you all very much.